thank you very much for this uh, invitation. So in this talk, I will uh, sketch some uh, relation between magnetic amplitudes for strings and the so-called Kitayev model. I will not talk too much about the Kitayev model because that comes uh, to the end, but let me just uh, mention uh, before we start that uh, the Kitayev model here, what, I'm, what I mean by Kitayev model is that I refer to the model of uh, topological quantum compute computation not to some other model which is uh, we, we because there are many models called uh, after uh, Kitayev so uh, this is really the the, the lattice model the, there are also many lattice models called after Kitayev so this is really the topological uh, quantum computation model so let me uh, sketch a little bit what is uh, going on so <clears throat> When, uh, usually in physics, to uh, uh, study the evolution of a system, we use path integral. Because the path integral allows to uh, implement a geometrical and topological property of the space-time or configuration space. Here we will be uh, discussing for a little moment uh, bosonic strings. So if you have a string that is supposed to live in a quotient space. So if the string is closed in the quotient space, when you lift it, uh, it's no longer closed. The only thing we know is that it has some winding, which I call W. And this winding will be uh, an element of the group G. So I, 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 I have a space a set X or space or whatever, uh, on which there is a group G acting. This is uh, the, the general setting, acting on the right for uh, my convention. And now when a string propagates in space, in fact, let's co consider a single st string, it propagates along a cylinder. This sh should come here, because the right picture is here. But now if you are, uh, if you consider an open, uh, a lifted string, then when it propagates, it propagates under some open cylinder, if you want, you, you have a cut inside the cylinder. And this will allow me to define some, some operators, which are called T. And then I will have a similar picture when strings interact. And when the string interact, I will have some uh, new operation that will be available acting on the symmetry operations, because here, uh, here the, the operator T is supposed to be a symmetry. Then it will commute with propagation. While here, there is a new kind of propagation, which is in fact also an interaction where the string is split into two strings. And then you have to act on the tensor product space here. Therefore, uh, the algebra T uh, comes uh, equipped with a coproduct structure. And in fact, it turns out to be a quasi-Hopf algebra. And this quasi-Hopf algebra uh, appears also in the twisted version of the uh, Kitaev uh, model on the lattice. So let's uh, be a little bit more uh, expository on uh, quantum states. So uh, what is a quantum system? In general, uh, to a given quantum system, I will associate a Hilbert space of states and uh, observables, which are operators acting on that Hilbert space. Nevertheless, I should stress that uh, the state of the system is not a vector in Hilbert space, it's a ray in Hilbert space. It's a vector, a non-zero vector defined up to uh, multiplication. And this is consistent with uh, physical predictions that say that, in fact, uh, if you have a state represented by uh, uh, by uh, by uh, psi, uh, if you want to know if the system is 
in another state represented by chi, then you have just to take the scalar product of the two and square uh, and the square modulus of the scalar product, and this is uh, the probability. And of course, uh, a symmetry is something that will uh, preserve those uh, probab probabilities. And it turns out that after a celebrated the theorem by Victor, that every symmetry acting on the states can be implemented by a unitary or anti-unitary transformation acting on Hilbert space. And this is a transformation which is defined only up to a phase. This is by far not the most general uh, situation for describing symmetries. It has been, uh, it has been uh, generalized by uh, Mack and Chomerus in to uh, uh, some Hopf algebraic setting and even quasi Hopf algebra uh, setting. And here we will try to to illustrate that on a, on a very simple example. Usually all the operators are unitary, except that uh, time reversal charge conjugation, which are anti-unitary operators. Now let's move on and consider uh, a simple, uh, the, the, the situation that occurs when the sub of the operators form a group then you expect that you have a representation of the group on the states of the system. This representation on the states of the system is not necessarily a representation on the Hilbert space, because states and Hilbert spaces are, uh, states and Hilbert space vectors are uh, only related up to a phase. So everything uh, turns out to be uh, defined up to a phase. Therefore, uh, when you have uh, the group multiplication, you will recover uh, the image of the product only up to a phase. And since these are operators in Hilbert space, they are expected to be uh, to to follow an associative multiplication law, which turns out that this uh, omega is a group cycle. Well, group cycle means, uh, in fact, it's a function here of two group elements, which satisfies that identity. You can ask your question, can I get rid of that phase by uh, just uh, a, a change of arbor? So let's, let's, uh, let's define new operators, which define uh, from the previous one by their phase, because Wigner's theorem says that anyway, the operator u is only defined up to a phase. And then if you want to cancel uh, the phase that occurs here, then you have that it must be of this type which means that it is a co-boundary. Then you see that group homology is playing a, a somewhat important role here. In fact, the, the phase here is, uh, can be removed if and only if it is a, a co-boundary. The general form for uh, group homology is this one. So we will define a co-chain to be a, functions of, a function of uh, n plus one element in the group and uh, of uh, of n element, sorry, so n cochain is a function of n element, and it has to satisfy that identity. So d o omega is a n plus one cochain, so we introduce a new element here, and it has to satisfy that, that uh, identity. First g0 acting outside, then g0 inside, then g0 and g1 moved to the next one, and so on. Here, I implicitly assume that they are uh, taking values in an abelian group, uh, which itself carries an action of, of G, such, in such a way that this G0 acting on the value of the cochain makes sense. Okay, <clears throat> so let's continue and uh, consider a particle. So a particle in a magnetic field. So uh, the particle is moving on the manifold M, and uh, we assume that there is a magnetic background, B, which is a closed two-form defined on, uh, on that uh, manifold. <coughs> we cannot take an arbitrary closed two-form because we want to have a, a line bundle uh, over that manifold whose connection is, uh, whose, whose connection, Nabla, has curvature the two-form, the given two-form. So this constrains the, the uh, the two form to be 
uh, to be in the integral cohomology class. But if this is done, then we can uh, try to define a path integral. So for those people who are not uh, so familiar with physics, so if you have a physical system, say a particle, and if initially it is at x, and if you want to see if finally it comes at y, then you can compute the probability amplitude for doing this uh, from transition from here to here by a sum over all the paths. This is uh, a famous uh, formula by, by Feynman. And this is, in fact, somehow <laughs> a substitute for that, because you should sum over all the cylinders. <coughs> but let's, let's stick to this uh, simple case where you, you will try to sum over all the paths, and the summation over path, so phi is a path, is weighted by usually i times the action of the path, but uh, it, it is standard to, to use a Euclidean metric and we put a minus. S of, of i. Okay. Now, what happens if you want to turn on a magnetic field? It just means that uh, the standard amplitude for the path that you would take here is just weighted by a of phi, and a of phi is just the holodomy of the connection along that uh, path, and you can compute explicitly uh, this. So here I. I assume that uh, I am given a good cover, so B is dA on U, and on two intersections I have this, and on three intersections I have this, and this uh, gives a, this so-called integral cohomology class. But if you want, you can forget about the, the line bundle. If you if you if you just want to have a global picture of it, let's let's just see that. Let's just admit that to any path, you have to associate a. A complex number, which is the holonomy of that. That's an explicit formula. If you if you need to have it, uh, I just uh, show it for uh, concreteness, but it's not so important. <clears throat> and then from that, you deduce a projective group action. So a classical symmetry would be any action that preserve the any group action that preserve the action S and the, the two-form magnetic field, but it is not because you preserve the external magnetic field that you preserve the line button. And in fact, there is a, an action on the wave functions uh, in the line button, and this action is a projective action. And, you get, and then you get a representation of a projective representation of G on sections of the line button, so you first pull back the, the line bundle, and then you come back to it. You pull it back, this is this operation here, and then you come back. And this generates a projective representation of the group. Well, typical example is the uh, action of uh, Zn on Rn in a uniform magnetic field. If you want the corresponding twisted group algebra, which is the algebra generated by this operator Tg, algebra, not, not group, is, is, would be just a non commutative torus. Now, the interesting point for, for me is to uh, try to generalize that uh, to strings. So, in the case of a, tr of a string, uh, the, the, instead of, uh, going along a path, you go along a surface. So uh, here, if the bundle was trivial, then the amplitude was, would just be the integral of uh, uh, the exponential of i times uh, the, the, the line integral of the one form along this. In the case of a string, we take a two form. So we have here a, a two form b which is supposed to be a potential. In fact, it is not this way that you should work, because you should not assume that the two-form is given, because here you don't assume that the potential is given. You assume that the magnetic field is given. So in the string case, you should do the same. 
you should say, okay, I, I have a given magnetic field for my string, which is now a free form. So I give me a free form H and I assu assume it to be closed. If I assume the free form to be closed, I can derive a, a sequence of, of fields here, uh, which in fact just correspond to a gerb on that manifold. But again, whether it's a gerb or anything else is not so important. What is important is that you have a two form, a free form H, and then you have a two form potential, even if only locally defined B. So let's uh, continue and uh, I will uh, I will define, I will now assume that on that manifold there is a group action. So I will have three differentials on that uh, many, uh, on the differential forms. One differential would be the ordinary uh, theorem differential which I call the delta here with a, a little check, it's a, it's a check co-boundary operators. So uh, the quotient in the tree complex is, uh, has uh, several indices because it is a, a differential form of a given degree. It, de it is defined on Q-fold intersection of uh, open sets on a good of a good invariant cover and it is function of uh, R group indices. And then I have three differentials, and out of those three differentials, I will con construct uh, one big differential, which is uh, uh, D, which is a combination up to some signs of the differential, the RAM, and CHECH, and it satisfies D squared equals zero. This is interesting because it allows me to combine this with the last, this big differential with the last differential and, uh, which, with the last differential, which is a group, uh, cohomology differential. So, the, this can be solved quite, quite easily sup in the following sense. Suppose that I have a, a free form H. Suppose that this free form is exact. It need, but it need not be exact in my case. It's uh, because the, it is the, the, the image of uh, the, the relation is, is this one. Instead of having just the RAM, I have to have the RAM and CHECH. But if, if it is globally exact, I have only the RAM. And suppose that it is invariant. G star of H is H. Now, what can I say about G star of B minus B? <laughs> it is zero because of that and that. Therefore, I can assume that it is exact if I am in, in a topologically trivial set. Let me call it the result AG. So this is a one form that depends also on G. And then I can continue with this. Let me consider G star of uh, AH minus AGH plus AG. If I take the differential of that, and use, uh, and use uh, this, I find that this is zero. So, by, by uh, Poincaré lemma or whatever, assuming triviality, this is D of something, so let me call it phi G, phi E I H. In fact, uh, here I, it's, uh, um, it's I D log because I will take phi AG to be a complex number of modulus no, one and not its phase. And then I can continue. So this is a function with value in U1. <clears throat> so let me consider 
uh, g star of phi hk phi minus 1 g ghk phi g h uh, k and phi minus 1 g h let's consider that a big uh, contribution and again i can derive it so if i derive it i see that everything simplifies and this is a constant and let me call that constant omega g h k and now by construction omega g h k is a free cosine and it's a constant free cosine the picture which i did here is just a refinement of this when the fields uh, a b uh, and phi are only locally defined but the general idea is this one so starting with a free form which is closed and invariant i construct a series of uh, of uh, objects a one form b a two form uh, uh, no a two form b a one form a g and a function phi uh, j g h and finally a constant omega g h k in such a way that uh, omega g h k is just a is just a, a number and it's a one cosine so what this all has to do with uh, strings in in uh, in uh, on orbifold uh, i i just want to uh, define the magnetic amplitude of the string so i have the surface sigma which is fact is the surface here And on the so on the surface, I because it's a it's a it has to be equipped. Sorry, it has to be equipped with a, a two form. So this is this this part here, and then on the boundary here, I equip it with a one form, a w, which is integrated from x to y, and of course there is a correspondence every time so this point is here because in fact this is nothing but uh, <coughs> a closed surface on 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 the quotient space <clears throat> one way to check that this amplitude is a nice amplitude is that it has lots of uh, nice properties for instance uh, the cut here uh, viewed from from the side the position of the cut is arbitrary so why why here what this one why not another one which is uh, deformed in fact the amplitude is completely invariant under under this transformation it is also invariant under uh, the gauge transformation because when i look at that system of equation at each step i solve an equation of the type d of something equals something else so if i add to my solution uh, an exact form it still works so uh, the 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 next the complete result has to be completely invariant under this these choices it is and in fact the hilbert space of a single string can be viewed as a as a as a, as a space of section of line bundles over uh, the position of the string, so over the loops, and uh, the, the wave function is a section of that line bundle. Now, if I want this to be compatible with the action of, uh, of the group, I have uh, to, uh, as in the case of the particle, I have to translate things on one side and translate thing on the other side so i define a an action of the translation group and that action of the translation group depends on the winding so this is uh, the right formula that will uh, tell you uh, whether that will work with a global invariant and now you can uh, compute from this formula you can compute uh, this the uh, the product of two operator and satisfies this 
algebra. And this algebra is interesting because it's known. It's a deformation of the uh, Dreenfeld uh, double of the group algebra of G. And you can have a combinatorial interpretation for that uh, co-product in terms of splitting uh, the free tetrahedra that correspond to uh, the first string, <coughs> the second string with the, the winding here, matching the winding after translation, and the uh, last string. A very similar uh, thing takes place for the interaction. So if you want to define uh, an interaction of the, of the free string, then you have to, to take your uh, pair of pants and, uh, and, and cut it in order to make it simply connected. Then all the cuts are equipped with, with windings and the resulting magnetic amplitude takes this form. Okay. So the, the nice, uh, the, the, the algebraic setting is that of a quasi-hop algebra. So let me first say that uh, an algebra A is a Hopf algebra if, in addition to its multiplication, it has a, a co-unit, epsilon, a co-product, delta. So the co-product is supposed to go from A to A tensor A and a non-typode that goes from A to A. It satisfies a lot of things. The, the antipo, uh, first, uh, the co-product must be co-associative, uh, the co-unit must be the analog of the unit for the co-product and so on, and the antipode must, uh, uh, in fact, the, the antipode is the inverse of the, of the identity for this, uh, for the convolution product. Two interesting examples, the group algebra, so the linear combination of group element with coefficient in a field, with a very simple co-product and the function of the group with the, the point-wise co-product in, in, in that sense that uh, delta of f uh, is a function of two variables which is just obtained by multiplying the, the group elements. Now, a quasi-Hopf algebra is something similar but a little bit more complicated. In fact, the co-product is not co-associative uh, in a simple way. It is, if you compare the, co the, the two relations that should be equal when being with co-associative, they differ by an element omega. This element omega e itself is supposed to satisfy more identities for consistency. Okay? So, to, to summarize, uh, a quasi-Hopf algebra is like a Hopf algebra, except that the co-product is only co-associative up to some omega. And finally, you could ask you the question whether it's also co-commutative. So co-commutative would mean the, the order in the co-product, in the result in the, the co-product, do, do not matter. And of course, uh, usually an interesting example, it matters. So, for instance, here, if uh, the group is, is non abelian, it matters. Now, in order uh, to, uh, to uh, have a control on the difference between the co-product and the opposite co-product, we, we assume the existence of uh, an element R that satisfies that relation. What you get, once you have this, is an action of the braid group. And now you can, coming back to the, to the magnetic amplitude for the string, then you have already some operators acting here, acting separately here and here. You need to compare them. And when you need to compare, when you compare them, you find how the operator must act on the tensor product, the tensor product, which is here. Okay. Now, finally, how do you interpret the property of the, uh, of the, of the uh, quasi-Hopf algebra? First, the braiding. Uh, the braiding uh, appears when you want to uh, pass from one cut to the other cut. So here, we, in the amplitude, we made a certain choice of the cut. So 
we, we started with a string of winding uh, VW and then you split it into two strings. Uh, the first string has winding V and the second string has winding W. But there is, there is an equivalent, a, a non-equivalent choice for the cut. You could, of course, you can move the cut homotopically wherever you want. You will always get the same thing. But there is a non-homotopic choice you can do is to this one. And you still go from a string with winding VW to uh, a pair of strings that satisfies the constraint that they must, the total winding must be conserved. But it, it <coughs> is slightly different. And you move from one to the other by an action of the break group. Action of the break group, which is given by uh, the, the, the quasi Hopf algebra, the quasi, quasi triangular part of the quasi Hopf algebra. Again, the, the whole thing uh, depends on the choice of that phi here. So the phi is located here. When you choose a phi, where you, you make a certain choice in the tensor product. Now, if you have four objects, so one string decaying into possibly three strings, there are two different choices, at least, you can do. You can first uh, say that uh, the result is a tensor product. So this is one, this tensor, oh, <coughs> sorry, this tensor, this one, tensored with this one, or this tensor, this one, tensored with this one. And of course, you won't get the same result. You won't get the same result because when you write down the, the amplitude uh, according to, to, uh, to what we do here, you have a phi and the phi is evaluated on that triangle. And the evolution of the phi on the triangle tells you which tensor product you, you take. So you, you have this non <coughs> co associativity property which comes from, ultimately, the relation between the phi and the omega, because the non associativity is uh, governed by omega. OK? So let me, in the last, uh, say, couple of minutes, uh, <laughs> try to uh, explain a possible relation, well, a relation with a, the KTF model. So the KTF model is a lattice model. So therefore, all what we have done before with differential form, you can do it on, on the lattice. So uh, we take uh, X to be a, a finite space, if you want. Then you uh, you define a, 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 a N form on that finite <laughs> space to be just a, an anti-symmetric function on, of N plus one element. And then you define the discrete Durham uh, formula like that. For instance, derivation of phi is just this, derivation of A is this, derivation of B is this. And the differential is nilpotent. OK? So this would be a, a, very, a very simple uh, uh, finite analog of uh, the equation I wrote here. So what is this famous Kitaev model? So let, let, let me let me just take uh, uh, a few uh, minutes to try to to motivate uh, the Kitaev model. So uh, initially, it's a model in quantum computing. So what is quantum computing? You will have some initial state, which is uh, made of uh, a certain number of uh, qubits, some unitary evolution which is made of uh, gates, quantum gates, and then at the end you get a... This is incoming and the other are outcoming. And at the end you get some uh, quantum state in a system of n qubits, of course, and you do measurement to, to really get a number. Now, this is a very nice picture. But uh, there is a problem. So uh, the full power of the quantum computation relies on the fact that uh, the unitary evolution uh, still remains unitary. So that all the quantum computation, all the idea of quantum computation remains uh, fully available. 
And around uh, uh, 97, uh, Kitayev uh, proposed uh, that uh, the unitary evolution here should be replaced by some uh, topological evolution into into quotation. So, because everything which depends only on topology is very robust to to external uh, perturbation. And how could this take place? So, in fact, the initial evolution and the final evolution should be made of some uh, states, which are the, the analog of the qubit. So, let me take here four states, and here also four states. Mm -hmm. And the evolution, in fact, should be made by braiding. So, uh, here you will evolve, evolve like that, and and this one should could uh, could uh, go this way, for instance. So whatever that is, the evolution operator, instead of, of big, uh, uh, pure, uh, simple unitary evolution, uh, it should be some some kind of uh, of uh, braiding in such a way that you can always move this by perturbation and that the property will remain the same. For this to be rich enough, the object here should have some structure. And the structure is that they should be they should be uh, decorated by some uh, say quantum number, let's call it alpha, and some internal state, uh, let's uh, call it n. Uh, or uh, i for uh, in fact, this is in fact a representation of something, and the i is an index in that representation. In such a way that you keep some non-triviality uh, inside this. And now the model uh, presented by by Kitaev is a so-called quantum double model, where the Hilbert space on which this object lives, H, is in fact the Hilbert space of uh, uh, G to some power E, and what is E? In fact, G is a finite group, and E are the edges of a ribbon graph. So you define a ribbon graph, whatever, uh, and to every edge, you associate a group element, and then all those functions from the edge set into C form a Hilbert space. And now on that Hilbert space, you define a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is made of uh, two parts. <coughs> a first part, uh, which is um, a conservation <coughs> Uh, the first part will assume that on every vertex the product of the edges is one, and the second operator will define a gauge transformation associated to the face, and that will multiply all the edges by uh, the same group element depending on, uh, on the orientation of the edge. And you, you sum over over it, okay? So uh, delta v is a constraint that on every vertex it should be zero. The, it should be the identity, and p v is a projector onto the invariant uh, states uh, on on the faces. So you multiply all the face element by by the same number. The interesting remark by Kitayev is that sorry. The interesting remark by, by Kitayev is that this is obviously a projector. For every vertex, it's a projector because it just projects onto the, the holonomy, uh, the trivial holonomy. This, by construction, is a projector because it projects for every face onto the invariant state and they commute. So finally, in order to find the ground state, you have to diagonalize simultaneously those commuting projectors. And that's very easy, because it amounts to choose 
uh, a given configuration, if the if the graph corresponds to a topologically trivial surface, so if it's embedded in the sphere, then you can always uh, find an holonomy. For every holonomy, you can always uh, gauge transform it to the identity. So this is just the, the image of the of the of the trivially uh, of the trivial flat connection. In the general case, the ground states are given by the homomorphism from the P1 of the surface into G, uh, to, in to G divided by the adjoint action. Now, in my, my, my last thing is to deform this. So we want to construct a deformed model. And that deformed model really relies on these uh, two free co-cycles. Now, <coughs> uh, the, the, the deformation is, is, uh, is very easy to understand. Uh, when, you, uh, when you are going to lift something in the definition of the gauge environment, you will insert a certain number of uh, free cosines. So, writing this in detail is, is kind of mm, a little bit clumsy because you have to figure out that all the orientation are okay and everything is okay. But let's just say that uh, if you have here a configuration with a phase of, uh, of degree four, and then you want to lift, then you have to multiply all the four uh, elements here, and you will just insert some, some uh, free core cycles. What is non-trivial is that uh, this insertion of the free core cycle still makes this a representation of the group, because the, all the free core cycles you get may uh, cancel when you multiply several times. So at the end, you get uh, an analogous uh, element of the uh, an analogous model as the, as the one by Kitayev, and finally, you will be able to, uh, to define an amplitude for uh, every graph, and that amplitude of every graph, uh, well, you have a Hilbert space, and then the first thing is to say, what is the ground state? And you can find the ground state uh, just by assigning uh, this the previous uh, amplitudes for the string, but in the case of a closed surface. With a bit more thought, you can uh, try to look at the <laughs> excitations of the model. So the excitation of the model will, of course, correspond either to a lack of, lack of uh, gauge invariance on the phase, or lack of flatness on the vertices. Lack of flatness of the vertices uh, could correspond to, uh, to uh, an open string. And then the transformation of the vertices on the faces correspond to the transformation of the, of the endpoints of the string that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that are on that face. This last part is a little bit more uh, say, not completely clear to me, but uh, it's work in progress. Nevertheless, uh, the, the ground state is, is uh, absolutely well defined. In fact, it can already be, be found in a paper by uh, some uh, uh, Chinese people in uh, 2013. Uh, I, I don't have the, their name in, in mind, uh, but I, I can give you references if you are interested anyway. Okay, so I think it's the point to, to stop. Yeah, but in this way, you get representation of red book with finite index, yeah? With this finite image. Yes. Yeah, and I, I, I remember actually Kitev was here, here on the stand. And he, actually, his actual suggestion if you have uh, like a red book of conditions coming from which not yet physical model, this some uh, fifth sort of one and so on, you get everywhere dense image and then one can re really approximate 
in the operator and ah you cannot approximate everything yeah you can't hear it just find a loop and then like yeah you so get that's a, if yeah. you operate it in like four dimensional space not really yes easy. yeah yeah yes indeed, indeed, indeed. that's a yeah it was kind of like baby version yeah, yeah of course uh, all this is uh, even if it looks complicated it, it's not uh, it's not enough to yeah. to do the job but um uh, the, the well, yeah of course more no questions comment he remarked that uh, i am almost all talks listen on the first time when is the hilbert space on that conference that means infinite dimension or i i yeah, your Hilbert space is infinite dimension. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it depends on... No, on no, not exactly. Fine, fine. No, it's it, fine. It, it depends, it depends. In the, in, in the string, I mentioned an uh, infinite hil dimensional Hilbert space and truly infinite dimensional one because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a space of section of a line bundle over the loop space. But let's forget that Hilbert space because we don't really use uh, the, the Hilbert space structure. Then at the very end, when I relate that string model to the Kitaev model, first of all, I have discretized the string. And at the end, if I want to make contact with the, with the Kitaev model, I have a strings over one point because the string do not propagate. So the only thing, the only degrees of freedom are the fact that the string can have winding. But in itself, the string has nothing more than its winding. So it's a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So a pity. <laughs> no, I, I hope that you can use infinite dimension no, comes no. to finite. No, no not, it's not a way to, yeah. too complicated. Anyway, but thank you. A lot of machinery. Mm -hmm. My questions? Physics. Okay, yeah. Okay.